Well, good morning, Family Church. Uh, you're probably not ready to see me up here this morning. Uh, my name is Ryan Cripps. I have worked at Family Church for a couple of years now. Um, this is my family. Uh, my wife, Katie, who has helped a lot in women's ministries around here. Our five-year-old, Ellie, and then our one-year-old, Jack, who is adorable. Um, we got into this first-time homebuyers uh, sweat equity program. Uh, it's the same program that the Irwins were in, the Cunninghams were in, and the Gotros were in um, as they built their houses together over a year. By a miracle, we got into this program. Uh, and the miracle was that I switched jobs right before we sent our loan paperwork in. So I had zero job time, which is not ideal uh, when you're trying to get approved for a loan. I've been at my job for one week. Will you trust me with a 30-year loan? Um, it's not a good place to start. And we got into this program and I was so excited. We were going to have to put about 1,800 hours into building this home. But the families that I had mentioned, they all said, you're gonna put blood, sweat, and tears into it, but it's worth it at the end because you have equity when you move in to your home. After about a year, um, there were five families, five houses. Everyone dropped out, which was kind of good news for us because we were late into the program. So that means we got first dibs on what lot we wanted to get and the house design that we wanted. So that was really cool. I was like, wow, God, thank you. Um, and then we are about two years into the program. Everyone's there. Everyone's ready to go. And there's another delay. Now, um, for those of you that have ever built a home, you know how difficult and frustrating and anxiety-inducing building a house is. And if you ever want to build a house, those things are a guarantee. They just don't put that in the paperwork. Um, we thought we were going to be running like a 5K. You know, we were trained, we were ready. We're like, okay, this will take about a year, year and a half, no problem. We can, we can do that. I have that much patience we didn't know that we were actually about to run a marathon that we were not trained for, that we were not ready for. And uh, it hurt. And it's been a painful process. We're in a series about running the race. And a couple of weeks ago, Paul uh, used a story about Jamie Ketchum, who ran a virtual marathon, and, and she ran this marathon. It was her third try. Uh, she wasn't able to complete the other two, but this time, unknown to her, she had friends and family that were going to meet her on her track at different segments of her marathon. And so about every five miles, there were a group of people, her life group, her family, a group of friends, a group of uh, girlfriends of hers. And at one point, her dad actually got, went home, got his bike and rode his bike next to her as she did her marathon. And Paul had a really great line. He said, she ran by herself, but she was not alone. And, and I thought that was such a great word picture of this series that we're going through about running the race. And then last week, Jason had a killer sermon that, that talked about how we are trained by God, God's sons and daughters, that he trains us during the race. Usually training happens before the race. You don't want to train during. But in this race of life, of, of our faith journey, God trains us in the middle of the race. And that God does that out of love and care for us because it, he promises to produce training inside of us. Today in our passage, we're going to be looking at what do we do during the race? So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Hebrews 12. We're going to start in verse 12. I'm going to be reading out of the ESV, um, which I know is not normal. Usually we go NIV, so I hope that doesn't jar you too much. So that's where we're going to be. Here we go. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Therefore uh, is the first word in this verse. And therefore is a really big word in scripture. It, it means 
in conclusion. It means uh, since I gave you information, here's what you should do with it. Um, it is hot outside, therefore you should probably not wear sweats and a sweater. Uh, since it is hot outside, therefore you should drink water. And so he's saying in conclusion of what we've just talked about, about running the race and keeping your eyes on Christ and, and encouraging one another and that God does this for training. In view of that, lift your drooping hands. Uh, if you've ever ran for a long time, you know when your arms start to get heavy and they kind of they kind of go to the side. It's a sign that you're getting tired. And when your knees start to get weak, it's not so much that your knees are wobbling; it's that you're starting to take smaller steps. Have you ever ran so hard that you're running, but you're actually going at like a walking pace? <laughs> this is what he's talking about. He's saying. You are running a race in your life and it starts uh, pretty early or at your conversion and it goes until the day you die. And, and as we run, there are tiring points. I think in Jamie's story, she said it was around mile 20 because you only train for a marathon up to 20 miles. And so the last, I believe six or seven are killer. And so this is, he's talking about the point where you get tired the point where you get weary of the race. He says, because we know that God has trained us, therefore lift your drooping hands, make, strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet. As I thought about this phrase, make straight paths for your feet, I, I was trying to figure out what is he talking about? And I think I got a little information actually when I was driving home yesterday. I saw a runner that was running in the bike path, not on the sidewalk. And I was like, why is he doing that? And I remember an old friend of mine that loves to run marathons. He's, he's one of those weird guys. Um, he said, sometimes it's better to run on the road because when you run on the sidewalk, there's like the little divots and sometimes the sidewalk isn't quite even. And he said, the risk of hurting yourself greatly increases when you don't run on straight ground or even ground. And I was like, I wonder if that's what the author is trying to get at. He's like, don't, don't meander in your walk. Don't like kind of run towards the finish line and then get distracted and go over here where there's kind of some bushes. It's a little uneven. Say, no, God has marked a race for you. There is a clear destination and you need to run with intentionality toward what God is directing you toward. Therefore, strengthen your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame, now pause real quick. Scripture calls us lame, okay? I'm just reading scripture. That's just what it says. Um, so that what is lame, you, you can turn to your neighbor and say, you're lame, because that's what the Bible says, okay? Uh, you, what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Um, when you run on uneven ground and you get tired, that's when you're at most danger to get hurt. And, and the author is encouraging us saying the training, the discipline that we talked about last week, that happens and it is not to hurt you, even though a couple of verses earlier it says it is painful rather than pleasant, but he's saying it's not ultimately to crush you under the weight of that training, but ultimately the object is to be healed. God is not throwing discipline your way to beat you down into a pulp where you're like, okay, I'm so weak, I can't do anything. The training is there, though it is painful, it is to heal. It's the idea of setting a bone. You guys have seen in the movies where they're like, okay, I'm three and one, two, and they set the bone and the, the person screams. They're like, sorry, we just had to get it back into place so that it can begin to heal correctly. Because if we don't set the bone and it starts to heal crooked, it will cause a lot of problems down the road. And so God's training is not to hurt, but it is to heal, though it's painful. 
there are some encouragements of what we are supposed to do in this passage. The first thing he talks about is that we are to strive for peace. Look at verse 14. It's very simple. It's right there up front. Strive for peace. Peace is a very used word in scripture. Uh, It's very used in our culture. I'm at peace with myself. And as I thought about this, what does he mean to strive for peace? Um, the definition uh, that we have here. State of tranquility or quiet. This is from Webster's, by the way. A state of tranquility or quiet, a state or period in which there is no war or harmony in personal relationships. Um, If you are a parent, you are never at a state of tranquility or quiet. Um, We have a one-year-old. He's uh, 13 months. Um, He is learning how to use his vocal cords Um, So if he hears the dog bark, he barks. If someone squeals, he squeals. If he hears a garbage truck, he starts beeping. Like he is just a noise machine, a noise copier. Um, The second part of this definition, a state or period in which there is no war. I can pull my phone out. And in five seconds of scrolling through Facebook, I can be at war with anybody. You can read comments on videos for less than a minute to know who you are at odds with, who I'm at war with. Their opinion? Oh, yeah, that's not the right opinion. They should have my opinion. And we can go to war instantly. We are to strive with for peace. And I think what's really interesting is that he doesn't, the author doesn't stop there. The author goes on and he says, don't just strive for peace. This isn't like, hmm, tranquility within myself as I shut all other noise out of my life. But he actually says, strive for peace with a couple people. No, he says, strive for peace with everyone. With social media and the internet, everyone is a lot more than it used to be when you said everyone. It used to be everyone in your circle. Now we're talking about everyone you come in contact with. Strive for peace with everyone. I like the way Paul said it. He says, so far as it depends on you, (laughs) be at peace. There are some people that you breathing, they think they're at war with you. I have a neighbor um, that gets mad at anything. And so we try as best as we can to not do anything (laughs) that affects him. Um, And sometimes it is impossible to have peace with some people. But we are to strive for peace with everyone. So I want to stop for a second. I want to ask, this is a really hard question. Who are you at war with? If you're at war, well, let me answer this. If if your answer to that is, oh, I don't really feel like I'm at war with anyone, that's really good. Because it means you listened to last week's message when Jason talked about the peaceful fruit of righteousness that comes through training. If your answer is, I feel like I am at war with someone somewhere every minute of the day. COVID has brought this out quite a bit and it's actually been teaching me a lot and I'll get to that in a little bit. But sometimes we wake up looking for war because that's just like something to do. Or you you open up and you have your news feeds and they're always at war with another news feed. What would it be like if we were a church that was not at war? Or what if we had people in our church that decided, I, you know, I'm not going to be at war with anyone anymore. I'm, I'm going to try it. I'm going to strive as hard as I can for peace. Who are you at war with? A name or two came to your mind. If you want to just write that in your notes to the side as you think and pray about those names, we'll get there pretty soon about what we should do with this. I had a relative, this was actually about uh, four year, uh, three years ago, 
and I had made a comment about um, the peace that God gives. And, and they messaged me and they said, how, how do I acquire this peace that you're talking about? Because I feel like there's no peace. There, there's always noise. There's always war. I'm, I'm always frustrated at somebody else's opinion. And as I looked at my response three years ago, it's very similar to what this passage talks about. This is really interesting. But if we jump back a little bit to what Jason talked about last week, it says, for the moment, Hebrews 12, 11, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. I think this phrase right here, but later, a lot of times in the training, the peace doesn't come. Well, a tragedy, I'm at peace. No, it comes later. It, it comes through the wrestling. It, it comes through the process, but later it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness. And Jason made a good point last week. To those who are trained by it, meaning it is possible to have discipline and not be trained by it. And we know this. If you're a parent, you know this because how many of you have ever had to discipline your kid one time when it comes to eating food at the dinner table? Not very many. Or don't touch that. Well, I told him once and now he knows it and now he follows and obeys completely perfectly. No. Discipline is a training process and it doesn't always take the first time. The peaceful fruit of righteousness I would say it this way. The peace in your life is a fruit of your relationship with Jesus. It is not a state of mind or it's not a state of being. Peace is not acquired through shutting out noise that's all around us. Peace is acquired through an understanding of who we are as God's children and knowing that he has our back. I was trying to think of a way to explain a peace of mind um, or having peace. And have you guys ever uh, had your debit or credit card and you slide it at a store and there's this little bit of anxiety that comes up in your heart and you're like, ah, I hope this goes through. I can't remember if there's $10 on here or 10 cents, but I sure hope I can get this coffee. And uh, when I got our stimulus check, you know what I didn't wrestle with? Peace sliding my card because I had money in the bank. And, and there, I knew that there was no problem. We go to the restaurant and we'll, you know, we're, we're not gonna split a dessert and we're not splitting a milkshake. You get a $6 milkshake and you get a $6 milkshake and we're all getting milkshakes. I'm not splitting my dessert with anyone because I, there was a peace knowing that I had that money behind me. And peace works the same way in your life that when you know that God is behind you, and you know that our God is faithful and true and that every single thing that happens in your life, good and bad, God promises, I'm going to use it for your training and it's going to produce a peaceful fruit of righteousness. That gives us confidence, that gives us hope, that actually is a faith-building trust. That is a faith-building trust. Uh, relationship that we can have with God, knowing that he will always be behind us. Next thing the author tells us to do is to strive for holiness. Uh, strive for peace with everyone and for holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Um, just to pause really quick, a lot of people pull this verse out of context and misuse it um, as an idea that we need to be perfect and holy in order to see God. So if you're not perfect and holy in this life, there's no way you'll see God in the next. And I, as I thought through this, I thought back to math, uh, high school math. So if you guys hate math, I'm sorry, um, but this just makes the Bible make so much more sense sometimes. So it's, some people will say, it, if you have peace and you have holiness, then you will see God, you will get to heaven, you will, 
you will get salvation. And that is not at all what the author is trying to say here. He's actually making a logical argument. And if you read through the rest of the book of Hebrews, by the way, Hebrews is my favorite book in the New Testament because the author argues and he builds a statement upon a statement and creates a, a theology and understanding of God that makes so much sense. But it's actually if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Okay, some of you guys just tuned out because you're like, oh, math. Okay, bear with me. <clears throat> so if we look back to what the author has been saying, he's saying God only disciplines his kids. He doesn't discipline his non-kids. I don't discipline your kids because they're not my kids. I discipline my kids. God disciplines his kids. His kids are trained. And the trained kids develop peace and righteousness. Therefore, if you are a son or a daughter, you will produce peace and holiness. This argument is made all through the book of Hebrews. We don't have time to look at all those places, but, but God, the author is saying, look, the peace and the holiness, that fruit is proof that you are already a son or a daughter and you will see the Lord. If you don't have the fruit, that means you're not a son, which means you're not gonna be with the Lord. Make sense? And so he is telling us that we, this fruit is a byproduct of what has to happen in our life. The training is a, uh, it's a have to, it's a get to, and we get to grow in God's training. The author then tells us a couple things that we should not do, which is very good for those of you that like black and white things. Um, I like when the authors are straightforward and tell me exactly what to do, what not to do. It just makes sense for me. It works. What we are not to do, do not miss his grace. Verse 15, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. This verse is also pulled out of context. And people will say, well, it's your job to get everyone to get God's grace. No, you are not responsible. You are, you are not the deciding factor in someone else's faith, right? But like Paul had mentioned several weeks ago, Jamie did run by herself, but she wasn't alone. In the same way, just before this chapter, the author of Hebrews says, encourage, build one another up, spur one another on, encourage even the more that you see the end days coming. It says, build each other up, which is a theme through the book of Hebrews. It says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace. This is the idea of as you run, if you guys have ever seen like a track race, they have lanes, and I have my lane and they have their lane. I'm not responsible for running their race, but I can encourage them. The same way that Jamie's family and friends could not run the marathon for her. She, Jamie can't run five miles and her husband Drew runs another five and then the kids break up a mile because you know they're tiny so they can't run as far. And then she gets, no, that's not the way it works. Jamie has to run the whole marathon. But you can spur one another on. When you see their hands starting to droop, when you see them getting tired, it is encouraged, I would say, commanded in scripture that we bring one another along, that we build them up. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. I was reminded of the passage uh, in Lamentations 3, uh, 25, where he talks about, God has new mercies for us every morning. He has new mercies every day. Every day, God's grace is there and every day we have to obtain it. You don't get saved once. You don't say, yes, I believe. And then we're good. No, it is a constant encouragement that has to happen. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. Sorry, that was Lamentations 3.18, not 3.25. And so the other thing that the, the author tells us to do, he says, do not let bitterness take root. This word for 
Well, let's look at this passage real quick and then we'll break it down. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled. I didn't finish my story. So about a month and a half ago, um, we visit our house every after church on Sundays to just see and make sure they're still working on it. And about a month, there didn't seem to be any movement at our house. And so we were trying to get a hold of the guy that was building it, and we couldn't get a hold of him. So we finally called his boss, and they said, oh, yeah, we fired him and his crew. We're looking for a new construction manager. And if you're trying to build a house in our economy right now, it's next to impossible, and it's really expensive. You've probably seen that wood and everything is almost double, triple the price of what it used to be. And they fired the guy in the middle of this project. And when the lady called to tell me this, I was so full of rage. It took a little bit because if, you got, if anyone knows me, I am pretty even keeled. It takes a lot to rock my boat. But I got that news and I was so full of rage. I was so full of rage that I could not think straight. I was so full of rage. This was three weeks ago. I was so full of rage from that call on Friday that I, I had to lead worship Sunday morning. I came to the office and Jason uh, Howell, he was already there. And I just broke down. And the whole morning, the whole night, I, I like couldn't think because I was so angry. I have never been that mad in my entire life, not even close to that mad in my entire life. I, I was getting so angry that that weekend I had gone out into my shop. I had taken one of my hammers and I was just smashing two by four boards just over and over and over. And I, my arm would get tired and I switch hands and I would hit and hit and splinters are flying off of these two by fours. And I was so angry. I was hitting these boards with such rage that when I woke up the next morning, my shoulder blades were burning because I had pulled muscles in my arms because I was so mad. And I got to church and I was so full of rage. I couldn't even lead worship. I'm like, the, the, I can't, I'm not even in the mindset to think about Jesus right now. That story is exactly what this verse is talking about. See to it that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. That is a huge understatement. It causes destruction. And by it, many become defiled. This word defiled in the Greek um, is the word uh, me, I know. And it is the idea of a stain of a color that's not original to a, a piece of clothing. So it's the idea of a white linen shirt getting grape juice on it. That it just completely stains, it soaks into, it defiles what it's on. And it doesn't just defile you, your bitterness. It defiles those around you. I was so full of rage. I couldn't even have healthy relationships with my kids, my wife, let alone my congregation that I'm ministering to because I was so full of anger. The author goes on and, and he says, he gives a great example. He gives an example of Esau. See to it that no one is like Esau, sorry, that there's no sexual immorality among you or be unholy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. And all of a sudden the author brings Esau into this. And if you think about Esau, he had this evil, bitter rivalry with his brother Jacob that happened in the womb. Scripture tells us that they fought in the womb. And when the one was born, the other one was grabbing his heel, trying to get out of the womb first. Okay, that's like, that's a whole nother level of rivalry. Like that's not way outside the ballpark of like ducks versus beavers. And so Jacob and Esau had this rivalry that defined who they were. Esau was running this race of his life, not to win his race, but to make sure that Jacob didn't win. You ever seeing those kind of people that, that have become so bitter in their life and things have happened that they don't, want, they don't want happiness, but they sure don't want happiness around them. 
That's the defiling that bitterness does that happened in my life. And so the author says, don't be like Esau. Don't be like Esau who had this, this little tiny momentary pain of hunger when he comes into the tent from hunting and he's starving. And he's like, brother, give me food. He's like, well, give me your birthright. What good's my birthright if I'm dead? Sure, whatever, just give me the food. Little dramatic. Don't be like Esau who had a momentary trial that God was trying to do something in his life and trade that for something so fleeting, something that a bowl of soup, which wouldn't even hold his hunger for the day. He, he took the easy short road over the long marathon. He took the walk around the block over the marathon that God wanted. He wanted to do something in Esau's life. I couldn't see God's grace in my bitterness. Once I was done throwing my temper tantrum and I asked for forgiveness and, and the peace that came after, like we talked about in verse 11, it seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. After that, and I, my head was clear, God had done some extraordinary things through this trial. Uh, the first is that he is really teaching me patience. Um, and God has given me peace because this is out of my hands and I can do nothing to resolve this issue. And the house that we have, we have a contract that says we get this house for this price, period. Which means now that our budget is about twice over what it was originally, um, we do not pay a dollar of that, which is a huge, huge blessing. So I want to end with this. We're all in a race. We all are. And we are responsible for how we run. But it is also our duty to help the brother or sister alongside of us. And this week, this month, many of you are in that. And I want to encourage you that after this is all done, after the pain, the trial, the hardship is over, God wants to teach you and train you and that at the end of it, once you come out of this, there will be peaceful fruit of righteousness. It will make your faith stronger. God is in your race. Trust him as you run. I'm going to release to the campus pastors. I love you guys. I can't wait to see you again. And I hope that as we all run this race, you will be more like Christ at the end of it.